Um, so I'm really glad to, to, to present uh, the book, which, which has just uh, come out. So it's um, the first seminar, uh, basically, uh, where I, I present the book. So the first academic discussion on the book. So I'm, I'm really uh, looking forward to it. Um, there was a, a review of the book in, um, in Le Monde, but a very short one. Uh, so a very short one. So uh, I really hope that uh, I will get uh, yeah, more uh, comments, uh, inputs, uh, um, critics uh, even on the... Um, on the book, especially because it's written, I tried at least to, read, to write it from a European uh, perspective. So uh, let me share my slide. Uh, I think it works, so, but the problem is that, yeah, it's the beginning, so you can see my slide. Eh? Irena, I see you nodding. So um, here is the title, Europe contre Europe. So basically, Europe contre Europe, which uh, can, can be translated as uh, Europe against Europe, entre liberté, solidarité et puissance, between liberty, solidarity and power. Uh, basically, it's um, an, um, a history of um, European integration of various forms of European uh, cooperation, more generally, not only uh, uh, the EU, uh, the European Union, but various forms of European uh, um, association uh, attempt also at common policy between 1945 and uh, today. Uh, so you can see the, the, the cover, so that's why the cover um, uh, refers to the, to, the, to the Brexit uh, talk because uh, this is also part of uh, the book. At the, at the very end of the book, I mentioned the, the Brexit and uh, also the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and you can see this picture about the, the post-Brexit uh, quarrels in the UK, uh, with ironically the, the, the pro, the pro uh, let's say the, the, the stop Brexit guy uh, looking a bit like uh, Nigel Farage, but it's uh, of course a coincidence. Um, so in this, uh, in this presentation, I will um, very uh, simply talk about uh, first why I, I wrote uh, the book. Uh, how I implemented my um, uh, research strategy, uh, which archives in particular I used, uh, what are the main results of the book, and in particular I will elaborate on the three types of Europe um, that um, I, I would like to, 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 that I try to uncover in this book. So uh, uh, let's say a market-oriented Europe, so this is the word liberty, a, a social environmental Europe. This is the um, word uh, solidarity. And the, the, what I call Europe puissance, what the French call Europe puissance, uh, which is hard to translate. And basically, it will be also uh, interesting to discuss about uh, the, uh, how to translate this notion of Europe puissance in English, uh, probably uh, Europe as a power, uh, or even in, in German. I don't know whether it exists, uh, uh, Europa Macht or, or something else. Um, so uh, the, 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 it's always hard to translate. But in political science, from the um, um, economic perspective, it's called a neo-mercantilist Europe or neo-mercantilism. And then I will uh, conclude. Um, so I tried also to check the time. Um, so uh, basically, um, yes, my starting point was, was to, to understand uh, the um, European integration on, uh, from a long-term perspective, uh, and in particular, its um, uh, various uh, strands. Um, of course, for let's say the last 15 years, we are going from, from one crisis to, to, to the other. Um, when we observe the, the EU since uh, basically 2005, um, a lot of internal divisions have been um, uh, uh, underlined between North and South, between East and West. And so uh, I, I thought that um, uh, it, it, it would be useful to use history as a lens to try to, to make sense of those different forms of uh, Europe, uh, different forms of European uh, cooperation. Um, so that's why I wrote this book um, on the long term, with long term perspective, trying to identify what was original or not uh, in terms of European economic policies. And so that's why I studied both uh, some member states and the, and the EU, because uh, um, in many instances, what you can observe in Brussels uh, 
uh, mirrors what, what's going on uh, in, uh, in member states. Um, I try to take into account that, uh, and to illustrate the diversity of those different practices and to, to go beyond the intergovernmental uh, versus federal debate, even though I take uh, this debate into account, I think it's not um, uh, old fashioned, it's really at, at the core of uh, uh, the, the specificity of European institutions, but I think um, I tried uh, at least in, in this book to um, illustrate a new way to understand those uh, different conceptions of Europe, um, not from an institutional point of view, but from an economic and social uh, perspective. So um, that's why I focus, uh, so that's my the, the second point. How uh, did I translate this uh, research question into um, a, a coherent um, uh, strategy? Uh, I choose to focus on public policies, on economic policies, and in particular on, on the decision-making process uh, through uh, archives. Um, so here I am in, in, uh, in a seminar uh, with um, historians mainly, I, I suspect, so uh, uh, I don't need to be too, too long about that. Just let me uh, uh, recall that uh, uh, it's useful to, to use archival um, uh, deposits because you can um, um, find more information than in, in, than in uh, official accounts, than in memoirs, than in published sources. Um, so you hardly find the smoking guns, but you can um, discover more details on the one hand, but also alternative paths, uncover alternative paths that were not taken, but alternatives that were taken seriously into consideration by the decision makers um, at different points. So you can reveal the um, various um, um, path that history could have taken um, and that were subsequently forgotten. Usually, politicians in their memoirs, for example, they, they, may, they mainly talk about their successes and not about uh, the, their, fa their, their failure, about the, the alternative project that uh, they supported and which uh, failed uh, um, in the end. Um, in terms of uh, lens, I try to adopt a European viewpoint, so it's quite um, a challenge. Um, I uh, study archives in three countries, France, Britain, and Germany. I took into account other international organizations um, in order to, to be, uh, um, in order to provincialize Europe, as uh, Kiran Patel uh, uh, said, uh, in order to consider the, the, the European community and the European Union as one organization among others, one international organization among other, taking into account that the, the, the uh, organization of European cooperation on the European continent could have occurred through the, the UN or through the OECD or through other kind of organizations. And also for specific um, case study, I used uh, non-state actors archives, um, in particular the European Trade Union Confederation and some archives of uh, the, uh, the, the, the from companies or from, or from business organizations. So I did not do it for, for, for the whole period from 1945 to, to 2020. First, because there are no archives uh, on the 1990s and um, the, the 21st century mostly, but also because it would have been um, uh, impossible to, to manage. Um, uh, but I did this study quite systematically on the 70s and 80s, to some extent on the 60s, and for the rest of the period on, on specific uh, case studies. So on the whole, I used archives in eight countries, a lot of literature, of course. Uh, I, this book is also an attempt to uh, make public uh, the, the, the work of many uh, historians of Europe and historians of European integration, um, which has not caught the, the, the attention of, of, um, of many uh, um, of many colleagues of the academic world, in my opinion, not enough, at least. And it builds on a previous book uh, published a couple of years ago, which, which spans the period ranging from 1973 to 1986. So uh, governing Europe in a globalizing world, world that uh, Yanis uh, mentioned. Basically, uh, the book was uh, my habilitation 
in France, we have an habilitation too, um, except that it's um, it's a bit like a second book in the in the British system in the sense that it can uh, uh, be on a, roughly the, the same field as as the PhD. And uh, so my PhD was on the 60s and my uh, Europe in the 60s and my uh, habilitation was on European integration in the 70s and 80s. And um, so I include those research in the book. So the, the, my current book, Europe contre Europe, Europe against Europe, is um, an extension of governing Europe on the whole 1945-2021 period. So what are the main uh, results? I will elaborate on them. Um, my main idea is that we can uh, we construct the whole um, pattern of organization of the European continent, especially from the economic point of view, uh, by using a, a typology of three types of uh, economic policies, three types of economic policies. Um, which could also, to some extent, uh, be linked to, to uh, a more broader typology of different types of uh, also uh, um, ge geopolitical uh, behavior. But let's stick to the, um, the economic and social uh, realm. So um, the subtitle of the book is Between Liberty, Solidarity and Power. So liberty refers to basically um, free market policies. It's very um, easy to, to uh, fathom. It could also refer to um, liberal uh, democracy. Solidarity refers to uh, social policy, environmental friendly policy. So I define those policy by um, a willingness to uh, redistribute, to protect the, 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 the weakest. Um, those who, have, uh, who are um, uh, hampered by the, 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 the capitalist system. And the, the third category, power, mean basically the willingness to assert uh, European interest um, um, aggressively uh, in the world, uh, for example, with protectionism, or at least with neo mercantilism. So I will, I will um, uh, elaborate a little bit more uh, on this later. Um, basically, I use this third category because I, um, when you observed how um, the, the economy really works, you observed that um, it's, it's not just a, a dualistic opposition between the, um, um, the market friendly on the one hand and uh, the, let's say the socialist on the other hand, uh, between business and, uh, and, the, and the worker. Because um, in many instances, business actually um, do not want more free market, but want to be protected too. Um, and here, you, you, you feel the need for a third category when government protects business, not for uh, protecting uh, workers first, but uh, mainly to, to assert um, the industrial potential of one's, uh, of one's country of, or, or of one uh, community. So in this sense, power is linked to uh, nationalism um, and hence the link to protectionism. Of course, it depends to what extent you, you, you implement those uh, three um, categories. I will uh, come back to it later. And of course, um, while I um, uh, embark on, on this journey, um, studying the economic and social policies of uh, Europe from 1945, I learned a lot about uh, how European institutions actually worked, and so that's why I also proposed uh, some um, um, my own conclusion about uh, the, um, uh, how the, the European Union uh, has worked uh, since uh, 1945, or European institutions in general, not only the EU. So let me turn now to the three um, Models, uh, so I use models uh, not uh, for love of uh, acronyms, but uh, or for the, the love of concept, but just uh, in order to ease the comparison and to avoid uh, mere chronological accounts of events. At some point I was drawn um, under so many um, actors, events, 
um, discovered in many different countries. Uh, that's I wanted to make sense of it by using category that could describe what occurred in different countries uh, at different times, but that referred to the same um, the same economic approach. So either uh, free market to lead, to boost growth, so the market oriented, uh, or to protect the weakest, but also the the, the, the third category to uh, tinker the market, not to protect the weakest, but to protect the producers, to protect uh, the, the the more uh, the more uh, powerful, if you want, and to protect one's own uh, community. So the so that's why those models are uh, anachronistic. Uh, by, by nature, um, it's simply. But I think they are useful. It's the same as the the, the um, uh, ideal type defined by Max Weber, um, uh, precisely in order to make sense of complexity. So those models um, also have radical uh, variants. So, uh, for example, if you um, uh, want to tackle the case of neoliberalism, and here you have a picture of Reagan and Thatcher, of course. Uh, you can, um, of course, link neoliberalism with, with the first version, and for me, it's uh, a radical version of the, the market-oriented uh, category. Um, so here, there, there's the, a debate how to differentiate the neoliberal with the, uh, let's say, the, the more moderate uh, market-oriented decision makers, for, perhaps because the neoliberals in particular target the welfare state. They want to retrench uh, the welfare state um, uh, using um, the title of a famous book by Paul uh, Pearson. And by the way, each of the three categories has radical um, uh, variants. So for solidarity, of course, it could be uh, the Marxist uh, socialist uh, society. Um, and for neo-mercantilism, the, the extreme form of neo-mercantilist uh, policy is um, was uh, sorry the, the policy waged by um, uh, many countries in the 1930s, especially um, nation, national socialist uh, Germany, with extreme protectionism linked to nationalism. But of course, uh, we should not uh, blur the distinction between the radical forms and the more moderate form of neo-mercantilism that I will uh, describe in this paper. So this is just food for thought, how to basically use the, the typology I used uh, in the book, in Governing Europe and in Europe Contre, Contre Europe, for um, other instances uh, for other case studies uh, of uh, at least the 20th century. Um, so here is um, a graph to try to, to synthesize the, the triangle of um, economic and social policies and um, their, uh, uh, their radical variant um, at the, the point of the, the three arrows. Um, so let's, um, so instead of um, making a chronological description of the period from 1945 to today, um, uh, which would be interesting, but I think it's already already well known, I um, uh, instead use this typology to illustrate what I mean and what I discovered in terms of market-oriented Europe, in terms of social Europe or solidarity, and in terms of um, uh, um, neo-mercantilist Europe. Um, first, so, um, the markets oriented Europe, of course, was and um, has been uh, at, the, at the core of the process of European integration. It's not really new uh, with the common market, the single market, European and monetary union, of course. Um, but um, if you come back even earlier, you can trace back uh, the starting point of this process to 1947, 1948, when the Marshall Plan was uh, unveiled because, the, the, as you know, the American, um, what was new with the Marshall Plan was not so much the transfer of funds because it already existed before uh, with bilateral agreement, but it was also the fact that, um, well, the sum were probably very important. It was a multi-annual um, um, uh, commitment, but also because the, the Americans forced the, Ameri the European to cooperate within an, an organization, the first uh, organization of European cooperation, the OEEC, 
um, the, which later became the OECD, the OEC, and within the OEC, um, the European countries had to um, commit themselves to progressively open up their markets. So, of course, in 48 and for most of the 1950s, most European markets were still um, heavily protected, uh, especially during the first half of the 1950s, because it was the, 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 the reconstruction, uh, the rebuilding of Europe. Um, but still, we, we, we find this uh, crux between European cooperation on the one hand and the building of a free market, at least within Europe, and also with, with the USA, because um, it's well known that um, the, the, the Americans also negotiated uh, a better entry for their products on the European market, which is uh, natural. So from the very beginning of European integration, not only with the EEC, with the ECST, um, European integration um, have been made through uh, the market. Um, but several models have been uh, debated uh, since, uh, since then. Should we uh, build only a, a loose free trade area or should we uh, create an integrated market? So the, the second uh, option was taken from 1957 when the common market was created. So the EEC, which is the ancestor of the European Union. And um, I think also uh, another argument, uh, um, and I think probably uh, Michel Weibel and, and, and the lawyer would be uh, sensitive to, to this argument, is that um, uh, even the current EU treaties are still based uh, partly on the Treaty of Rome negotiated in 1957, uh, signed in 1957, and uh, negotiated in 55, 50, 56. So that's why it's still, um, uh, it's, it's past history, but it's also current uh, events. And when the Treaty of Rome was negotiated, the British uh, proposed a free trade area. And I think it's really revealing because uh, throughout the period, um, so again, I, I have not studied British um, relationship with European integration comprehensively from 1945 to today, but um, uh, I have studied it in the late 50s and in the 70s and, and uh, the first half of the 80s. And you see this project of free trade area popping up regularly um, as a temptation for the British. And, uh, and since the, the Brexit vote in, two, in 2016, um, it's even more uh, um, uh, um, a temptation for the British. Um, and, and some of them tried to, some of the, the British decision maker, of course, have tried to, to implement this uh, vision by striking trade deals with um, uh, other countries and also by um, uh, um, envisaging in the, in the future a possibility to, to um, um, free trade by lowering um, so, some, uh, some protections and some, uh, um, some legislation also in terms of uh, social and environmental protection. So the, the free trade area model uh, uh, is still in the minds of many and could uh, possibly be implemented in the future if the EU were to unravel. Several models in terms of European monetary integration too, uh, because uh, if you study uh, European, the European Monetary Union that was um, shaped uh, by the Maastricht Treaty with an historical angle, you can, in the end, consider that it was only a partial European and monetary union that was created, especially if you compare with the previous report on EMU, Werner de Delors report, and if you compare with, with what was done during the Eurozone crisis with many decisions to complement, to um, uh, um, complete to some extent this European and monetary union. And beyond those um, big debates, uh, I can also um, um, pinpoint some specific new findings on the history of competition policy and neoliberalism. So uh, I, I made a lot of uh, research on the history of competition policy, the role of the ordo liberals, the role then of the um, uh, officials, uh, which were more geared by a um, um, US vision of, of uh, antitrust policy. Um, 
so here I, I can say a lot about the history of competition policy. This was also one of the the the, the area um, about which we we discussed with Professor Philippe Ter in the case of state aids uh, about shipbuilding. So the, the competition policy really began to to drastically limit the state aid uh, starting in the in the in the mid 1980s, and I argue that it was part of the. <clears throat> A neoliberalization of, of, of Europe to some extent. Uh, so it was um, asking whether neoliberalism began not by the European with the European and Monetary Union, but with, with competition policy. In terms of European, uh, in terms of monetary policy, uh, I, I put an emphasis on the, the failure of the common relaunch of 1978. Uh, it was called the locomotive, locomotive theory. Basically, Germany was the locomotive and had to relaunch um, uh, the um, uh, to relaunch growth in Europe. But then it hit the, the second oil shock in 1979, and then G Germany even experienced a short uh, and moderate balance of payment crisis. Uh, but I found in the Bundesbank archive that it was quite uh, a traumatic event for uh, for them. So. Basically, I'm not reinventing the history of EMU, but I'm just uh, providing a few, uh, a few more uh, hints. And basically, the book uh, contributes to the history of uh, neoliberalism that I try to, um, to differentiate uh, from classical market-oriented policy, which is not always easy. And of course, there's a whole debate about whether the older liberals in competition policy were neoliberal or not. By the way, I use the term ultra liberal in French, uh, but the term neoliberal exists too. So this is this is also something we can discuss. In terms of solidarity too, uh, I think he, um, so. The the attempt to build a social Europe um, have been there for a while, but have been less influential than, than the market oriented Europe, uh, to, 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 to be sure. Uh, so that's why I, I um, said in the, I wrote in the, in, the, in the slide that it was a more peaceful um, attempt. Again, it's, it's there since 1947-48 because the Marshall Plan in, in itself was uh, a manifestation of solidarity. So for, of course, for geopolitical concerns, but well, you, you cannot rule out also the, the, the moral implication. Um, it was a comprehensive ambition for, for some leaders, not many of them, but uh, in the book, I wanted to underline the role of a couple of leaders such as Willy Brandt, uh, Jacques Delors in particular, I, I um, document a lot uh, Jacques Delors uh, attempt of fostering a social Europe when he was president of the, the European Commission from 1985 to 1995. <clears throat> and in the end, uh, the, as you know, um, social Europe um, uh, has been implemented mainly through regulations. Um, so laws, directive, regu regulations in terms, uh, in, in very specific areas that were covered by the treaty. So again, it's the Treaty of Rome of 1957, which covered gender equality, uh, even if, if, if it was not called uh, gender equality in those days. Uh, but that's why uh, gender equality was one of the first area uh, of um, uh, EEC, EU social policy, working conditions, and then the environment. And, and here we leave the Treaty of Rome because of course there was no mention of uh, the protection of the environment in the Treaty of Rome. And um, uh, the, the field of environment is very important for countries uh, like mine, like France, because um, what I found, and I want to dig uh, more into um, EU environmental history uh, in, in, in the future, <clears throat> we have a common research project with Kiran Patel uh, on, on this, on the European uh, environmental policies in the, in the 80s and 90s. Because for a country like myself, you, you can argue that um, uh, parts of uh, the, the, the current French environmental legislation uh, comes actually from, from uh, European uh, uh, debates and European institutions. And you are left wondering whether without the EEC EU, the, 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 the environmental uh, law uh, would have been as constraining as they are in France. Um, because most of the, the, the actors that were the, the 
the, the more efficient in terms of uh, environmental policy came from uh, Northern Europe. <clears throat> um, targeted redistribution uh, is nevertheless, has nevertheless been important. So you think of the Marshall Plan, think of, uh, but then the Marshall Plan ended up uh, in the uh, 52, 53. There was a gap, uh, but in 75, a regional policy was created only with a limited amount of funding at first. But then um, in the 1990s, uh, 21st centuries, um, uh, it was um, uh, bolstered, strengthened, and played a big role, first to help Southern Europe, Ireland, and then Eastern, uh, Central and Eastern uh, Europe. And here I refer to, to Philippe Ter's book, uh, which uh, very convincingly compare Poland with uh, Ukraine, whose GDP uh, per capita were uh, relatively similar in 1990, and of course, which are uh, profoundly dissimilar uh, today. So I, I, I um, uh, kept the, the comparison in, in, in the book. Uh, here are a, a couple of new fin findings in my book, uh, European planning, democratizing multinationals, so the, the whole battle about the Fredling Directive, uh, which has been also tackled by other researchers than myself, such as Aurélie Andri and Francesco Petrini. <clears throat> so the, the Fredling Directive was a, a really interesting moment because they, it was uh, one of the first time that um, the lobbying of multinationals and the lobbying of uh, trade unions was uh, visible. Uh, within European institutions. I studied a bit uh, car emission uh, di uh, di directive, and here too, France was a bit reluctant to, to adopt um, uh, environmental friendly uh, regulations. Um, and above all, what I observed to account for the relative, the relative uh, failure of uh, social Europe or the, the, the weak development of social Europe, or let's say the modest development, because my, my book argued that there, there was some kind of, of social Europe, uh, basically, uh, I um, can explain this relatively modest development by, uh, well, first the fact that, of course, the, the welfare state was uh, developed at, at the nation state level and it rests on a, a strong sense of uh, community, of, of the, the national community. Um, solidarity rests on, on, uh, on the sense of belonging. But I can also explain it by the division of the social coalition, what I observed was uh, in particular a lot of differences between Delors and Mitterrand. Uh, so Delors was the, the president of the European Commission in Brussels, Mitterrand was the French president. Both were French, both were socialists, but they were not at all, or not uh, completely at least on the same wavelengths. And also there was no, uh, no, hardly ever a united front between Paris, Rome, Madrid. So the Southern European countries uh, have never um, been able to create a strong and uh, permanent uh, coalitions, coalition, um, the, the linkage between uh, those countries has never been as strong as uh, the, the, the Franco-German couple, which has, or the Franco-German motor, uh, as you say in German, uh, that has been um, uh, really influential from time to time and, um, well, all, all the way there to, to some extent, even, even uh, during the, the, um, the lowest uh, point of the Franco-German relationship. And then um, power Europe, so neo-mercantilist Europe. So basically, what does it mean? From the economic point of view, it means organizing Europe um, in terms of um, industrial policy, in terms of trade policy, uh, waging a more aggressive trade policy, uh, not a protectionist one, but uh, a less free trade uh, policy, uh, try to really organize the market and not simply um, count on uh, uh, free market globalization to, um, to um, uh, propel uh, growth. Um, so here, this dimension was confined mostly to nation states, industrial policy in particular, but we see um, some um, decision made at, at the European level, some, uh, some expression of this, this uh, willingness to um, organize the economy. Um, 
in order to favor European producers. Uh, you see it through uh, first trade negotiations. So the EU have tried to alleviate protectionist tensions with the US since uh, the beginning. Um, an interesting example too, uh, I, th I saw uh, Anne-Isabelle Richard among the, uh, among the listener is the, 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 um, the attempt to organize Eurafrica, to, to, to organize a relationship between Europe and some of its former colonies in Africa and elsewhere with specific trade agreements that rely not only on free trade, but also on uh, specific um, uh, um, specific perks for um, the, uh, the the poorest countries, especially uh, the the Lomé 1975 agreement was ex extremely interesting because it contained um, the Stabex uh, fund, which was designed to um, 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 made the um, uh, export revenues of the African countries more regular. It was basically um, a buffer a fund intended to um, increase, uh, to prop up the, um, the uh, African export earnings uh, during period of uh, low prices. So it's typically a neo-mercantilist tool because it is there not to uh, counteract the market, but to um, control it, regulate it in um favor of the the producers and here too uh, and today too with the carbon border adjustment mechanism that is currently negotiated you can argue that it's a kind of new mercantilist agreement uh, because it's uh, it gives um an um, uh, an advantage to uh, to european producers uh, in the past, there have been also policies at the European level to protect traditional manufacturing, so mostly regarding steel and car making, uh, more than in textile and even more than in shipbuilding. Like here, uh, I also referred to uh, um, uh, what I mentioned before. Um, so here it was mainly during the 70s and 80s. And promoting uh, high technology, uh, here the, probably the best a symbol of this neo-mercantilist Europe is uh, Airbus. Uh, so the, um, uh, the um, uh, manufacturer of uh, aircraft, uh, even though it's not an EU company, it, it was, it was uh, uh, shaped outside the EU by an, interna an, an international, an intergovernmental, sorry, agreement uh, between originally between France, Germany and uh, the UK, and then the Spain uh, joined. Um, but what I found in the, in the archives is, is that, um, uh, well, France was the more neo-mercantilist state, but actually neo-mercantilist triggered some debates, even in Germany. In Germany, in the late 1970s, it was the coalition between the social democrats and the liberals. And whereas some liberals, such as Lambsdorff, were um, extremely hostile to this type of policy, Lambsdorff uh, probably embodies the, uh, the neoliberal camp uh, in this government. Uh, other ministers, such as Volker Hauf or Hans Matofer, um, were not enthusiastic, but at least were ready to, to invest um, more state money into a new, um, uh, new sectors. So it was computer and so on. So here you have Airbus with the, the Airbus Beluga, which uh, symbolizes also uh, um, the European um, uh, mode of uh, production um, because pieces of, uh, of different planes were uh, moved around the different production sites. And here you have Amatofer and Lambsdorff, uh, who are probably less well known than other um, actors. Um, and here, yeah, I, I try to explain uh, in, co to, to, in conclusion why uh, neo-mercantilism didn't really took off. Uh, first, because it was difficult to implement in practice, uh, because as you can see with the Airbus model, if you pour money um, in a common project, you expect as a member state, as a company, uh, or as, even as a trade union, you expect uh, some return in terms of employment. And there, and there is a limit um, as to uh, how um, uh, spread the manufacturing uh, process can be. So you, you can construct uh, 
you can build a, um, a plane with uh, components coming from two, three, four countries, but not coming from 27 countries. Um, so basically, the, the, this is the issue of the, the return in terms of investment. There is also the, the issue of what was called the European preference, how to, how to define a European company. And of course, uh, it triggers more uh, general political argument about protectionism, nationalism, and even nativism. Because in the book, I argue that neo-mercantilism is on the um, is on the rising uh, tide today. Uh, sometimes, on in a very aggressive form, linked with nativism, especially with Trump, for example, who was a protectionist president, uh, or uh, Bolsonaro, also in uh, in Brazil. So you can be neo-mercantilist in different uh, fashion, of course. Uh, supporting Air Airbus is one uh, one way of being neo-mercantilist because Airbus was developed thanks to uh, um, important national state aids. Um, so you can argue that it was a protectionist venture during its first um, uh, 25 years. But you can also be a neo-mercantilist uh, while promoting uh, chauvinism. Um, so to conclude, um, in terms of, so the two, two main conclusions, uh, again, a conclusion in terms uh, of uh, the, the three models of Europe, but first let me uh, just elaborate a little bit on uh, what I wanted to, uh, no, what I discovered in terms of uh, the, the way uh, European integration worked. So first I wanted to, to study the project of Europe by all uh, actors um, uh, without uh, thinking, uh, without considering that they are just good or bad Europeans. So that's why I, I put an emphasis in the book on the various projects uh, developed by uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, in between four, 80, 83 and 87. Thatcher was really um, proactive um, in the European community, even if she did not portray herself as a good European, because especially for a, for a domestic audience, it did not uh, play well. Um, same for, for, for De Gaulle, for example. Uh, inertia and change. So I tried to show in the book that, of course, there is a, there's a lot of inertia in European institutions, because basically they, they are built to avoid a radical change. They are built to avoid uh, the, the domination by one actor, so, so change is quite difficult, but it can occur, and I would even argue, uh, argue that some change is uh, more likely to happen at the EEC EU level than at the national level, and here again I can take the example of environmental regulation. Um, again, I think within uh, some national framework, change in terms of environmental regulation is probably harder within um, uh, national arenas, uh, because of the power of uh, uh, the structure of power of some political parties or of, of, of some lobbies than at the ECEU level. The role of lobbies, the role of non-state actors. So here um, it's uh, possible to observe the role of uh, lobbies, but uh, from what I've, I've discovered, um, I don't think that lobbies are particularly more influential at the EU than at a national level. Uh, because, of course, if you study the archives of uh, ministries uh, of industry in any country, you will find plenty of intervention of companies. Uh, it's not something which is confined to uh, EU institutions. And then I had also um, a specific conclusion about Germany, because uh, Germany is al always referred to as an hegemon, uh, as a, a really a dominant power, especially since the Eurozone crisis. And I consider that in many ways, it was a hinge, a central element, but not a dominant power. In many cases, um, Germany was um, um, more moderate than France and Britain. Uh, so it was easier to uh, agree on its position than on the more radical position on France or on uh, the UK. Probably Germany expected less uh, from EU uh, European integration than France and, uh, and the UK in terms of from the economic point of view, at least for most of the period. And this is um, uh, the, the book deals with um, uh, 60 years, 70 years. Um, 
And um, yes, to conclude, so the long-term patterns of organization of the European continent, again, um, between liberty, solidarity, and power. And uh, today, and I will, I will finish uh, with that, the, 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 as I say, neo-mercantilism is on the rise. And uh, I think that today, uh, one of the main issue of the, the of European integration is, is um, whether it, it is possible to, to agree on, on an European neo-mercantilism. And at least uh, that's the, the French perspective, because if you, we, we are currently under the French EU presidency or the French presidency of the EU Council, I, I should say more precisely. And as you can uh, see, uh, this is a picture of uh, President Macron's discourse uh, on the 9th of December 2021 when he unveiled the, um, the priority of the French presidency. And uh, you have three main words, uh, relance, puissance, appartenance, so, so relaunch, power, and the sense of belonging. And um, uh, there have been also a, a, a lot of emphasis on puissance. Uh, but how to translate this um, project of European power uh, from words to deeds is another uh, matter. So thank you for your attention, and I'm glad to answer your question. <laughs>